Okay, good morning. Uh, my name is Jen Powell, and I'm one of the seventh grade lead civics teachers here in Leon County Schools. And I'm super excited today to share with you some information about in effective instructional strategies that you can employ within your civics classroom. Um, so we're going to be laying the foundation today, speaking specifically about five particular pillars that Dr. Marzano, which I know we are all familiar with here in Leon County, um, has created as his groundwork for um, effective instruction. So before we get into all that, I want to take a minute and talk with you a little bit about the history of how seventh grade civics has evolved um, in our state over time. In 2008, uh, the Honorable Justice Sandra Day O'Connor came to the Florida Legislature to talk about um, the proposal for a year-long civics class curriculum that would um, be taken by seventh grade students in our state. And the legislature loved the idea. Uh, so in 2008, her bill was passed. It was called the Sandra Day O'Connor Act. And in 2009, seventh grade classes around the state of Florida uh, totally revamped their curriculum to include this year-long civics program. Um, then over the course of the next few school years, the legislation changed to include an assessment component. And in 2013, uh, the first administration of the civics end of course exam assessment was given to seventh grade students in the state of Florida. And that assessment is particularly high stakes for a number of reasons. Not only does that assessment count for 30% of the student's overall grade and performance in civics for the year, but it also counts for 100 points of the school's grade um, in the Florida Department of Education grade calculation. So what does this all mean in today's discussion about in effective instruction? Well, what we need to understand is that in Leon County, when we heard about this bill, when we were selected to become the pilot district uh, for this new seventh grade civics teaching model, we realized that the odds were really stacked against us. We had this assessment component that was lurking. We had a brand new um, curricular, uh, unchartered territory, if you will. We had a lot of things kind of stacked up against us. And so what we decided to do as a county was to band together to take a look at what were going to be the best instructional strategies that we could use to convey the content to our students and ultimately to improve their instruction. Today we have a Civics Professional Learning Community, or PLC as it's most commonly referred to, um, that continues to meet. Uh, we were sort of the brainchild that formed back in 2008, and here we are, eight years later, still kind of doing the same thing, and hoping uh, to improve our instruction. The goal of our Civics curriculum here in Leon County is, number one, to improve instruction, to make sure that our teachers are abreast of the research-based strategies that we should be implementing in our classrooms to engage our students. We also want to make sure that the curriculum that we uh, send out to our district and that our teachers use are aligned not only to the state standards, but to the benchmarks, to the required statutes of instruction, and also to the Civics and, of course, exam assessment. All of that to say, our number one goal is to improve student achievement. And so that's what we've looked at over the course of the Civics Professional Learning Community years that we've spent together is how does our instruction of this content improve student achievement so that they can ultimately be successful on that extremely high course, uh, high stakes I should say, assessment that they will be taking each May. What I'd like to do is put the perspective of our Leon County curriculum um, into the Marzano framework. Since that's what our county has chosen to adopt, uh, a variation of it, of sorts, um, and what we have employed within our civics curriculum, and that's what we're going to be focusing on today, is what does Dr. Marzano and his team of educational researchers believe is the best approach at delivering effective instruction for our students? keeping in mind that end goal of improving student achievement. So we're going to take a look at the five pillars that Dr. Marzano and his team of researchers have put together. Uh, they've spent 20 years researching different educational strategies, and they've asked themselves the question over and over and over, what does a good classroom look like? What does a good school look like? What does good curriculum look like? Because at the end of the day, the bottom line is, is that good teaching has a profound effect on student achievement. And that's exactly what we've looked at 
as a team of civics teachers here in Leon County is how can we take our teaching practices and apply it in such a way that our kids can achieve. So let's start with pillar number one. Dr. Rosano and his team of experts believe that the first pillar uh, to effective instruction is to building and promoting academic literacy. Um, by this, we're talking about not only developing um, our students as good readers, but our students as scholars in those particular content areas, and our students learning uh, the academic vocabulary that requires them uh, to be able to engage in an academic discussion about whatever content-related material um, you might be discussing. Obviously, across each discipline, how you promote academic literacy is probably going to look a little different. Um, in civics, for example, we've placed a huge emphasis on how to be successful readers. Kids that read are kids that can learn, and that's something that we wholeheartedly believe uh, within our civics PLC group. So a couple of the strategies that we employ within our Leon County civics curriculum um, are the investigative reading strategy and our text coding or student-friendly reading approaches to building academic literacy. We know that our civics end of course exam is largely a test in reading. It's a reading uh, test about civics. And so if we don't challenge our students uh, with opportunities to allow them to do just that, to read about civics content and then talk with us about that, we would be doing them a huge disservice in under preparing them for this assessment. Um, the investigative reading strategy is a real basic approach to allow students to engage with textbook material related to civics content, um, breaking it down into smaller digestible chunks, and then asking them to produce the main idea. From there, each student brings to the discussion what they believe to be is the main purpose, and then the teachers will help kind of dispel misconceptions and affirm correctness. Uh, within those ideas about main ideas within our content. The text coding or student friendly reading approach as we refer to it as um, is a great strategy that many researchers support in terms of getting students to interact with uh, content and reading at the same time. Um, text coding is one of the was one of the new buzzwords that's out there that many uh, ELA teachers are using to help their students identify academic vocabulary to help them pull out from the reading material what words are necessary to understand the definition for those particular academic vocabulary words. And then at the same time, it, they're reading about the content. So this is kind of the, the base level, the foundational you know, uh, component of starting that discussion about content in your classroom. And it's a proven, effective instructional strategy because again, kids who read are kids that can learn. Academic vocabulary is something else that <clears throat> Dr. Marzano and all of the other researchers that we've explored uh, through this particular unit have affirmed is a real critical component for students in order to be successful, not only on the assessment, but just in a general classroom day-to-day -day setting. I like this quote in particular. It says, it's no secret that students with good vocabularies and solid methods for learning new words tend to do well in school. This is because most learning involves, because most learning involves the processing and understanding of unfamiliar vocabulary. At the be very beginning of the year, we as civics teachers talk to our students about the importance of taking time to really learn and digest the vocabulary. It's all new, it's all abstract, it's all words they've never heard before, and it's really their ticket to the discussion. I tell them, Ms. Powell talks in civics. I speak in civics all year long. If you don't do that groundwork, if you don't lay that foundation for yourself, you're not going to understand what Ms. Powell's talking about all year long. Uh, several of the researchers affirm that vocabulary is critical. It's the most fundamental component of being a good teacher is introducing and familiarizing your students to words that they are unfamiliar with. And you can approach this in a lot of different ways. Uh, again, from discipline to discipline, from grade level to grade level, how you introduce academic vocabulary is going to be different. But the ultimate goal is to make sure that you're doing it and that you're doing it often. So in Leon County, our civics vocabulary approaches come in a couple different forms. 
Uh, an oldie but a goodie is called the On the Border tool, which is pictured here. In the On the Border, the keywords, the academic vocabulary that we want our students to know for that particular unit or that particular chapter are already listed there for them. We get that list of words specifically from the end of course exam test item specifications from our benchmarks and from our state statutes. We know that these are words that they are going to have to know, uh, not necessarily to just regurgitate definitions on the exam, but because those words are going to be embedded within the questions. And that's important. We need to make sure that they take time to define those words, to draw pictures on the border, to help them connect meaning for themselves. So that when they sit down and they read that question that talks about diplomacy or that talks about foreign policy, those phrases themselves and the meaning, while they may not be able to tell us the definition word for word, is a concept that they're familiar with. Another tool that we've just implemented this year is called the Definition Depot. This is like the on the border in that we provide the words to them. We ask them to uh, identify some sort of imagery or illustration to help them uh, remember what the word means or to connect meaning for them. But we also ask them to take it a step further and to put that word in a sentence in context of the unit that we're studying. And boy, this is challenging. This is hard stuff in the beginning. But this is tried and true. This is proven research-based strategies on how to develop academic vernacular in a way that is comfortable for students and that supports their learning and improves our instruction. Again, the vocabulary and this academic literacy discussion in general is the ticket to the show. If we're not allowing our students the opportunity to engage with content, uh, with content in a meaningful way for themselves first, how are they ever going to be able to produce a discussion with us in our classrooms? And so I challenge you to think about that question today as we continue on. Looking at Pillar 2, Dr. Marzano and his team of experts have compiled a list of research-based strategies that they believe teachers who are good are using in their classrooms. Um, they have talked about uh, engagement as being one of the main ways uh, to make your instruction meaningful for the students. So it's identifying uh, hooks or bridges or springboard activities that draw the attention of the students right away. Uh, I'm compelled to talk about uh, an activity that I just did with my students last week uh, where they were asked to uh, take a look at qualifications that they thought uh, were important in a presidential candidate, and this is fitting, albeit this is an election year, uh, and then they were given information about potential candidates that they would consider for this election. At the end of the discussion, we found out that those identities of those people were real uh, Americans, many of them in politics. And the fact that we had taken time to sort of springboard that discussion to get them to think about those qualifications and traits really hooked them for the entire lesson because they felt like it mattered to me what their ideas were about those candidates. It validated the learning experience for them because it was all about them. One of the other things and research strategies that Marzano and his team of effort, uh, experts, I should say, believe is an effective strategy is the comparing and contrasting tool. Um, this is something that's you know as old as time, uh, comparing and contrasting in any form, whether it's a, a Venn diagram or some sort of graphic organizer or just a simple T-chart like you see here, uh, seems like a real basic task. But for many of our students, walking them through the process of thinking about similarities, thinking about differences, and then justifying their decisions, justifying that information, uh, is a really important skill for a number of reasons. Most importantly, comparing and contrasting uh, increases the likelihood that our kids can make connections when they're learning. Okay? If they can tell you what's similar and what's different, chances are they've connected the right and the wrong. Okay. In addition to that, it requires our students to activate prior knowledge. And any time that we get them to go back, dig deeper, think again, we're just emphasizing those critical thinking skills and those strategies that we know are tried and true. Uh, Dean, one of the uh, researchers that we were asked to examine for this particular unit, kind of offers a step-by-step -step approach on how he would suggest uh, or she would suggest going about 
comparing and contrasting um, in your room. And so I sort of took a look at this, of course, from the civic standpoint. Uh, the first step would obviously to be to select a learning goal. So say, for example, that we were asking our students to compare and contrast the Florida State Constitution to the United States Constitution, which is a benchmark and we know is going to be tested on the civics and, of course, exam assessment. Well, our learning goal for this activity would be for them to identify the ways in which the Florida Constitution and the U.S. Constitution are the same and different both in structure and in function. Then we would provide our students with some sort of graphic organizer. You can see here that I've provided a, just a snippet of <clears throat> an activity that does just this, comparing the two constitutions from the iCivics website. If you've never had the opportunity to take a peek at iCivics.org, I strongly encourage you to do so. Uh, it's chock full of engaging activities that are based on these very research, uh, or based on the research-based strategies that we're talking about today. So here you can see in a graphic organizer, very simply, they have the two preambles. They have the preamble of the Constitution, of the U.S. Constitution, and the preamble of the Florida Constitution. As we're reading through this information together, we can stop and draw on the things that are similar and the things that are different right away. Then Dean suggests that you might want to ask your kids to get creative with the material. Maybe we provide them with the first part of the graphic organizer, but then ask them to create their own, or ask them to add illustrations or color or some sort of you know, visual roadmap um, of how they're learning and how they're thinking and how they ultimately got to the end goal. We also want to make sure that the students know the difference in comparing and contrasting. That's really important. Because to compare something is to find the things that are similar. And to contrast is to find the things that are similar and different. And so it's real important that when we're using those terms that we have defined them for them, that for our students, and that we've modeled for them how the thinking process uh, goes when we are asking them to compare and contrast. Last but not least, we want to ask them for justification. We want our students to tell us why they categorized the constitutions that way, if we use that example, um, and then get them to dig a little deeper. And this allows me to take a moment to talk about the notion of uh, formative assessments, which I will in just one moment. To take, um, to take a chart from the Dean material, um, you can see here that they have suggested, uh, they've just put in chart format, the, the steps that we've discussed here today. Um, and so when I provide this PowerPoint to all of you today, when you leave, it'll be there for you to refer back to as you develop uh, comparing and contrasting activities in your own classrooms. The third pillar that Marzano uh, and his team of researchers believe is important in building uh, effective instructional strategies is to identify the learning strategies and the learning abilities of our students. And this ultimately boils down to the differentiation of our instruction. I love these images for a couple of reasons. Here you can see that this particular teacher is taking on, um, <laughs> taking the opportunity to explore all different kinds of learning modalities, whether it's the kinesthetic, whether it's the cooperative learning, the visual approach, the tactile approach, whatever it is. Part of our function as educators and as a school um, is to make sure that we welcome the students' natural ways of thinking, and they're all different, right? They're all different. All of our kids learn differently, they think differently, but ultimately to remember that through the exercises that we design in our classroom, regardless of what their ability or modality is, we can all get them to the end goal, right? Whatever that end goal is. And it can be something as small as one particular activity to something as large as the civics and, of course, exam assessment. It's important for us to realize that differentiation aims to do all of the things that Marzano and his team and all of the other researchers across our country and around the world support, and that is student achievement, right? So if we can find ways to connect with our kids, to figure out what makes them tick, to figure out how they think, we're only making ourselves better instructional leaders within our own classroom. Engagement is one of the ways that we can appeal to all of the different learning modalities within our classroom. You know, um, instruction is only as good as the instructor who is delivering it. 
And so it's important that we remember that standing up and teaching and just being that talking head isn't the way to connect with our students. We have to engage them. And engagement can come in lots of different forms. You know, we can differentiate within engagement itself. Maybe it's uh, playing music or using sound clips. Maybe it's finding videos or audio clips to support what we've talked about, to provide that visual and auditory uh, opportunity for students to look at the same information in a different way. Maybe it's forcing our students to get together and role playing with information uh, or content that we've instructed them about. Maybe it's finding those kinesthetic activities like this teacher did in the previous slide right, to get her kids to engage with the content uh, by moving. And maybe it's interactive games. And again, shameless plug for the iCivics.org people because they've really considered those things. They've looked at student engagement. They've thought about how kids think and how kids learn, and they've put it on a platform that's user-friendly. Awesome, awesome resource for civics teachers to consider to use and definitely something that we here in Leon County uh, support. When we're talking about differentiated instruction, uh, we would be remiss to not talk about the notion of formative assessments because as an effective instructor, we, as an effective instructor, we have to make sure that we are designing our lessons in a way that allow for that question and answer period that is so critical for teachers and students in terms of gauging where the kids are at. Formative assessments, and I know we're all a group of educators, so we, we probably know what this is, but in case you, you might be confused or if it's been a little while since you've talked about it, the purpose of formative assessment is really just to guide our instruction. It's informal ways of questioning our kids, of getting them to think about the material, and for us to kind of just do those spot checks while we're teaching to make sure that they've connected the ideas that we've wanted them to connect. All of the researchers uh, unanimously agree that the best teachers are the teachers who use formative, formative assessments often. They are the ones who question their children, who get them to critically think about the material, not just throw a bunch of content at them and expect them to figure out what to do with it. We have to lead them on that process, how we go about getting there, what process we take is up to us, but it's the utilization of those formative assessment tactics that really make it, uh, you know, set you apart from other educators in your field. Summative assessments, though, is what we hear most often, right, in the news, at our professional development meetings, probably at faculty meetings at your school. You're talking about the summative assessment, right? You're talking about those end of year uh, assessments, those end of course exam assessments. You're talking about the FSA or the former FCAT. Right, you're talking about the data that the schools use, that the state of Florida uses, to determine if your kids are learning. But we know, as educators, that that's only one measure. Right, it's only one measure, and it's a summative measure. It's an end of the road. It's a summary of what they learned. It's not an assessment to gauge if they're learning, or how they're learning, or what they're learning. It's if they learned. And it's too late to give feedback. So some of the assessments are important. I mean, I'm not, I'm not gonna lie and tell you that they're not. They're a part of our school grade. They're a part of our evaluation. Uh, they're a part of the kids' overall grade in civics if we're tying it back to our content area. But at the end of the day, the researcher, uh, researchers are going to tell you that time spent on summative assessments is time wasted because there are so many more things that we as educators can do and learn by utilizing formative assessments in our classrooms. So what's the moral of the story. When we take time to assess our kids in an informal fashion, right, we're asking them to do these things right here. We're asking them to remember the information and the content discussions that we've had. Let me go across the hall, baby. And Ms. Manuel, sir, thank you. We're asking them to um, understand the things that we've talked about. We're asking them to apply their content knowledge and their understanding of that information. We're asking them to analyze to evaluate, to critique. And all of those things, ultimately, at the end of the day, develop rigor. They develop stamina. They develop kids who can think for themselves. And that all equals student achievement, right? When we take time to formatively assess our students, we are, we're doing all those things. We're checking for learning. 
We're checking for those higher level thinking opportunities. We're making sure that we're dispelling any misconceptions that the students might have about our particular content area. And as Marzano and his team of researchers would agree, we're giving opportunity for self-regulation and for self-reflection, which are very difficult skills, especially for our seventh grade middle school kiddos to be able to do, but so critical when we're talking about preparing them for this high stakes assessment. We've got to embed that rigor in our coursework. Informative assessment is the way to get there. Go across the hall, Ms. Haney Wells, please, thank you. So I want to take a moment um, <clears throat> and ask you to consider the difference. And this is just, a, this is a self-reflection <laughs> exercise. How do summative and formative assessments differ based on what we've just talked about? Think about that for just a second. You can jot it down, talk to your shoulder partner if you want to. Okay. What, are, what are some things that we do already in our lessons within civics uh, that could be considered a formative assessment? What are some things that we could do better? What are some things that we could do better to become more effective uh, instructional leaders within our classroom? Well, we're going to turn our attention to those end of course exam test item specifications, which I've referenced uh, now several times. We know that this document is provided by the Florida Department of Education, and in it, it tells us all of the things that can or will be tested on the civics and, of course, exam per each of the 35 civics benchmarks. And it also tells us what we shouldn't focus our efforts on, and it tells us what definitely won't be tested. But more importantly than that, it takes time, and if you'll just take a peek at this packet that I handed out a few minutes ago, it takes time to explain cognitive complexity. And we, we've talked about this before. We know that Webb is the one who designed, you know, sort of the three-tier, low, moderate, and high uh, cognitive complexities. And what this tells us, what the test item specifications tells us, is the breakdown of the questions and the levels of cognitive complexity that they will be required to demonstrate throughout the test. We know that most of the test, about 60% uh, or so, is right there in the middle, that moderate complexity, that two-step thinking process that we've identified before. About 20% will fall in that low fact recall uh, level of complexity, and the other 20% is gonna be that high level, right? That analytical, critical thinking, evaluative uh, skills that we're asking our students to develop. So I want you to take a moment in your packet and Look at uh, the differences between those questions. You can see in the packet that it's the same primary source that's being used, right? What is that primary source? Okay, good, the Declaration of Independence. All right, so they're using the Declaration of Independence here, but they're providing you with three different questions to demonstrate low, moderate, and high complexity. So take a moment and uh, answer those questions, and then I want you to be able to tell me how are these questions different, and what can we do to support rigor in our classrooms to be able to have our kids answer these questions. Take a moment. Yeah. All right, so let's take a moment and look at the low complexity question. Right, in this question, it's just asking, where, where, were these, where are these documents found? Where are these documents found? It's a recall question, right? They might take a look at uh, the word he. We would have talked about that uh, exorbitantly in our classrooms. And we know that he is referring to King George III. That might recall that this is the colonial period. What documents written during that time? The Declaration of Independence, right? This is a recall question. We're not really having to dig not really even having to interact with the material that's in the primary source per se, um, and it's certainly not a two-step process. They don't have to know which document it came from to then get to the, uh, the next level of understanding. That's different from the moderate complexity question, which is asking how did the opinions that were expressed in these particular grievances influence the American political system today? Wow. 
of the questions on our civics end of course exam are going to be just like that. Asking our students to recall information about a particular uh, document, event, time period, person, etc. And then to do something with it. Connect it to today. Right? The high level complexity question is evaluating. It's asking them to make inferences about information, to draw conclusions on their own. So I bring us back to our question, right? How can we use formative assessments in our classroom in a way that supports rigor and will prepare our students to answer these types of questions? What can we do? What can we do? Well, here's some things that we can do. I'm going to give everyone in the room an opportunity to read uh, this excerpt from, uh, from John McCain. This is a, a speech that he gave. It's called The Cause Greater Than Self. And in this speech, he talks about patriotism, which is kind of an interwoven uh, concept that we discuss a whole bunch in civics throughout the year. And I want you to work with your shoulder partner or with someone close by to develop a formative assessment question that you could ask your students to get them to that moderate or high complexity level. And then I want you to do the same, but I want you to write a summative assessment. Remember, formative is informal. That's a discussion-based question. We're checking for learning and understanding, right? And a summative assessment question is a question uh, that's designed to demonstrate mastery, right? It's the end of the road. So if you were using this on a test, what would it be? Perhaps a formative assessment would be to write a one-minute essay about how you exhibit patriotism, right? Or how are patriotism and democracy intertwined? Just take it across to Ms. Manuel's room. Okay. That's fine. Just take it across. Thank you. How are patriotism and democracy intertwined? Maybe it's a multiple choice question. Maybe it's a written question. These are opportunities for the students to engage in conversation, to get them thinking about, to compare and contrast. Marzano would be like freaking out right now, so excited that we are intertwining these pillars because we're laying the foundation. We are laying the foundation for our students by developing these formative and summative assessments. Moving ahead to Marzano's uh, fourth pillar, which is all about curricular design. And, uh, and I'm just going to speak uh, very quickly in regards to curricular design because I've mentioned already about how here in Leon County, our professional learning community um, has taken time to develop their own curriculum. It's been a continuous work in progress uh, for the last eight years, and it will continue to be a work in progress. Because as new research-based based, based approaches are uh, identified, as there are goals and objectives from the district that are ultimately pushed down, we will continue to plan and reflect in a subconscious way. It's innate within us. It's something that we do as a team all of the time. Because we know we have this assessment component that is looming overhead. We know that that's there. We can't get over that part. Right? But what we can do is we can change the ways in which we are instructing our students to meet their needs, to improve our own instruction, and to increase student achievement. That's the name of the game. We know that within our own curricular design, we're taking into account our learning modalities and abilities of our children. We know that we're using our benchmarks, our state statutes, and other required instruction components. And we know that we're using a reflective and collaborative approach to planning. And that is what Marzano and Dean and Hoy all say is so critical when we're trying to improve our own instructional practices. The fifth and final pillar uh, that Marzano and his team reference is building instructional learning teams. And I just can't speak volumes enough about how amazing our Leon County Civics uh, professional learning community is in being that instructional learning team. We come together quarterly. You know, we used to get paid. This is a, a side note, right? We used to get paid to come together each month and meet and discuss and talk and plan and reflect and collaborate. But anymore, the money's gone, the grant's gone, and so now what we have is a group of passionate teachers who have seen the data to support that their instructional strategies are working, 
who are willing to come together um, <clears throat> to meet and share and collaborate and reflect on those instructional practices. We continue um, to have this network of professional development. We have uh, our own Leon County Civics uh, website that's chock full of resources and lesson plans and activities for our students to do because we believe in the foundation that we've laid in our district. We believe that what we've done supports these five pillars and we believe that we are highly effective instructors. At the end of the day, I want to close this up by saying that in Leon County, as I mentioned at the beginning of our discussion today, we have adopted a variation of this Marzano framework. Leon Leads, which is our instructional framework that we use for teacher evaluations and that we use um, as the driving force in our instruction in our classrooms, um, is developed based on the ideas that come from Marzano. You can see here from the placard that has been provided to all of you today that within this instructional domain, which is the bulk of our, the instructional framework for our county, we are touching on things that we've discussed today. We're touching on things that are already happening in our classrooms, and this serves as a reminder of what we need to continue to do to reach that good teaching status, to reach that effective teaching strat strat status that we're striving for. I'm going to leave you guys today with an opportunity to digest the information that we've talked about today and to put together all of the things that we've learned. We're going to put it into action. So thinking about building academic literacy, promoting academic vernacular, talking about those research-based strategies, reminding ourselves of differentiated instruction, working as a collaborative instructional team. Uh, I want you to spend some time today uh, developing formative assessments and developing activities for your students that are rooted in the framework that we've discussed today. I thank you so much for your time and good luck in the future.